Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to discuss the anterior cervical disc replacement procedure. This is an excerpt from a broader course in which we discuss on a high level the many different types of cervical spine surgery performed. If you're interested in seeing the full course, we've left a link in the description. The anterior cervical disc replacement is a very powerful surgical technique in the right patient. So let's start with an animation to kind of show what the procedure is all about. If you imagine this is the front of someone's neck, this is showing normal range of motion, and then kind of zoom in on the neck and see C4-5 and C5-6 degeneration is illustrated here. Usually disc replacements are great for soft disc herniation. So for example, here we have this disc here, but not a lot of bone spurring. And we remove the disc in this procedure and remove any herniations that are pressing on the nerves, again, on one or both sides here. Now this once again creates a gap, and that gap is filled by a device, but this time a device that allows for preservation of motion. So we use a trial to select the right size implant, and this is just a generic looking disc replacement device that shows that you can kind of fill the gap there. It could be done at one or two levels generally. And what's so powerful about this technique is that these devices are designed to move. So you can see here with forward and back flexion and extension motion turning to the side that these levels still move. So this is a motion preserving procedure, which is part of the reason that it's so powerful. So the disc replacement in general can be performed at one or two levels. That is the FDA labeling for it in the United States. And generally when I would use it is primarily for one or two levels. There are situations that are uh, unusual in which you can use them. For example, you can do a hybrid procedure where you do a fusion at one level and a disc replacement at the other. Again, you can do more than two levels if you want it, but the FDA labeling for it is really one or two levels, and that's the lion's share of the situations in which I use it. So now let's talk a little bit more about a specific example for when you might use it. Imagine looking at a slice of someone's spine like this, and you can see here that you would, ha here's the spinal cord, here's the spinal nerve, here's a disc herniation pressing pretty hard on a nerve on one side. The bulk of the pathology here is really a soft disc herniation, right? Here you can kind of see that this is all soft, there's not a lot of bone spurs showing up here. When you look at a sagittal sequence like this, you can see here again, there's this disc herniation. It's causing some pressure on the spinal cord. On this particular section, you can't see the nerves, but of course it is also pressing in the spinal nerves, as you can see on the axial sequence there. So when we do this procedure, it is again done from the front. That's where the anterior part of anterior cervical disc replacement comes from. You go in from the front of the spine that's coming in here and remove the disc at this level. Now as that is removed, you can kind of see that if you were to go in from the front and remove that disc, the one big difference between a cervical disc replacement and an anterior cervical decompression and fusion is that you do not remove any of the bone spurs that are in the back here. So you can see here how there's some bone spurs, those are the same bone spurs that were there before. When I do this procedure, when surgeons do this procedure, you're removing the bulk of the disc material. That includes the intervertebral disc that, for example, sits in the disc space, and also any of the soft disc material that's pressing on the spinal nerves of the spinal cord. You you generally do not do a lot of bone work when you do this procedure. And the reason for it is because if you remove bone, you leave some bleeding bone. There tends to be a propensity for formation of reaction bone or reactive bone at those levels. And sometimes people can develop something called heterotopic ossification, which is the development of bone in places you don't necessarily want it to be. The most extreme cases of that will lead to a fusion. So sometimes people with a disc replacement device can actually go on to fuse that level. And that's kind of a more extreme situation for heterotopic ossification. So when I'm teaching this procedure, I generally tell people, I don't do disc replacements in a situation where I expect to cause a lot of bleeding bone. So I might do that. So if I'm using a drill or using something called a kerosene rangeur or affectionately something we call a punch, then I generally will not do a disc replacement. Those are situations that I would typically do a fusion. Now, if you were to imagine looking at the same 
implant, this case, and taking a slice through it, you could imagine that it might look a little bit like this. So here you can see that you've taken out the disc material. Here again is the spinal cord and the spinal nerves coming off on both sides. The disc is gone, but here you can see there's some bony structures, and those are native bony structures. This is something called the uncinate process. We don't generally remove that stuff. This is really a procedure in which soft tissue is removed. So to remind yourself again, this is the axial slice here. We've removed all this disc. We've removed this stuff over here but there's some bony prominences that we're leaving in place. And the gap that is created by removal of that disc, that is occupied by this disc replacement device. And again, there's different types of disc replacement devices, but that's where it goes. You can decompress the nerves, decompress the spinal cord, and then replace it with a device like this, which is why we call it a disc replacement. Now, Unlike a disc replacement, if you look at an anterior cervical decompression and fusion, or an ACDF, here you can see all this bone work can be done. You can remove the bone spurs here. You, any stuff that's pressing on the spinal nerves, you can remove. You, and the difference, you can remove some of the bone spurs in the back here, something we call chamfering of the osteophytes in the back there to really decompress the spinal nerves and spinal cord well. But when we do that, we usually fill it with something that is static. This device doesn't move. It's designed to kind of occupy that space, and it's rigid. It's a fixed structure. It's got like a static dimensions to it. And then when we put that in, we often put a plate on. This device often has some degree of pliability to it, and that's kind of a function of the engineering or the design of it. So this kind of gives you a sense of the different degrees of decompression that are done when you do a disc replacement versus an ACDF. Now, if you were to summarize the anterior cervical disc replacement and fusion, I think you could really summarize it in a few ways, but let's think about it in a structured way. First of all, with respect to the decompression, again, because you're doing a decompression from the front, it allows you to address pathology that is preferentially in the front of the spinal cord, a ventral or anterior pathology. It does allow you, because it's a midline procedure, to get to both sides. So you can do a bilateral decompression when you do this procedure you really are removing soft tissue, so it's disc and ligament. You generally don't remove a lot of bone material for the reasons that I mentioned before. So it's great in situations where the pathology is caused primarily by disc and ligament pathology, or primarily disc pathology. And that would be like classically a big soft disc herniation with radiculopathy, that's classic for it. It's really good for disc level pathology. You can't really get behind the vertebral body itself. And most pathology tends to be disc level, so that's okay, but it's important to kind of enumerate and just identify the fact that it's best for disc level pathology. This is a procedure that preserves motion. That's its cardinal strength. That's the situation in which we want to use it. That's probably its most distinguishing feature is it preserves motion. It's a disc replacement procedure. It is not good for instability, and that might be a byproduct of the fact that it preserves motion, but if the motion's abnormal, we don't really know how these devices behave. So generally, when people are, are candidates for this, I will check flexion and extension x-rays to see if they have instability, because these devices haven't really been studied for how they behave mechanically in the setting of instability, so I don't use it when people have instability. It does require some degree of disc height preservation. If people have a lot of disc height loss, I generally find it very hard to kind of distract it open and put one of these devices in. We consider kind of overstuffing the disc space by distracting it open and plugging it in. In my experience, these devices aren't designed for that, those kinds of axial loads because you distract it open, put one of these in, and kind of sandwich it in there, and then it kind of loads on it, and I find that people have very little motion at those levels. In general, what I think we've all learned in the spine surgery community is is that you don't want to overstuff the disc space. You remove the disc and replace the space. And sometimes it's not necessarily as tall as you might get a disc space when you do uh, an ACDF. So for that reason, I consider it a requirement that people have reasonable disc height preservation going into surgery, because you're not going to get any more disc height out of this procedure. There is a much lower rate of adjacent segment degeneration, and that's one of the strengths of this procedure. And it's felt to be because when you preserve motion at these levels, the other levels don't necessarily see that increase in stress. Some people would argue conversely that patients that are candidates for a disc replacement are different patients than people that are candidates for a fusion. So they're different populations, so it's kind of hard to compare apples and oranges. But in general, what the literature would support, now the most recent data suggests 10 years, that there is a lower rate of adjacent segment degeneration for a disc replacement. Many people interpret that to mean that if you're a good candidate for a disc replacement, you should really think about that as the procedure of choice. Lastly, I would say that in terms of the clinical situation, it has been primarily studied for cervical radiculopathy. 
how it behaves with respect to myelopathy, which was in, in the initial studies not uh, part of the population that was studied, and how it behaves for neck pain yeah, is very hard to say. Not that a fusion is perfect for neck pain, but I think what's not clear is how uh, disc replacements really help with neck pain. Having said all of that, in the right patient, which is generally a patient with a soft disc herniation, really severe radiculopathy, this is an incredibly powerful technique and something that I think is important to learn uh, if you're a surgeon. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.